So today we're going to cover a pretty underreported story in the first in a new series for the channel that I'm calling Frozen Waffles, where us southern cityites and land acknowledgement LARPers are going to explore the crucial stories we're missing from the far north. No, not Barry, the real north, the high arctic. We're talking Inuit, permafrost, melting ice sheets, and narwhals. Which brings us to today's story, the Nalutjat land guardians protesting Baffin land and some critical questions about the Mary River mine expansion, like... Why is this project being allowed to go ahead when there is clear opposition from Inuit in the communities? When will the federal government stop valuing natural resource extraction over Inuit and wildlife survival? Run. In early February, a group of seven concerned hunters traveled for two days and over 150 kilometers to set up camp and a blockade on the airstrip at the Baffinland-owned Mary River Mine. The Guardians protested a proposal to double iron ore output at the mine, from 6 million tons to 12 million tons, and to build a 110 kilometer railway north plus a second port at its destination in the Milne Inlet. The blockade inspired another group of Inuit who showed up to the ongoing community hearings that week. While the blockade and protest like this are rare in Inuit culture, the motive behind it has garnered widespread support. Leaders say Inuit do want jobs and development, but the worry is the long-term consequences if they don't take a stand. Yes, yeah, you can see it's dusty all over. That pink glow on the snow and sea ice is iron ore dust. It's coming from several huge uncovered stockpiles at the port. The fear is, the dust is getting into the food chain. Narwhals eat the char, and we eat the char, and, and bears eat the seals, and, and arty char, and that's the concern for the Inuit. Mm. and the hunters, yeah. The now ubiquitous iron ore dust has been a primary concern of hunters for years in the region. Because their whole trucks, they're not covered with any uh, tarp or anything like that to keep the dust inside the whole truck. They just load it up and took off to mill without covering it. Plumes of red dust are very common because of uncovered trucking, their ore crusher, and open air stockpiles. Oh no! With residents complaining that they're no longer able to get clean drinking water by melting snow. <laughs> Turns out, residents weren't impressed by Baffinland's girl boss feminism campaign of turning the arctic foxes pink. Oh sorry, I'm being told that was a side effect of the dust on wildlife? Just like the staining seen around seal hole openings and dust pollution keeping the geese away. Those are fucking Canada goose! Baffinland's defense is that they always said there would be dust, and that while well, yeah, you might be able to see it, how harmful can it really be? But it's pretty clear to locals that the iron ore dust has seeped into the ecosystem, with some hunters noting an unnatural red discoloration in the organs of char. Local researchers say they've found elevated levels of iron in char near the mine's port, but more research needs to be done on what that means for the people who eat it. And red dust isn't the only particulate concern. There's also black carbon, otherwise known as soot. Between the freight ships and haul trucks, the rate of soot has increased more than 65 tons a year. Compare that to 574 tons of black carbon across the entire Canadian Arctic. That's an 11% increase from 2017 levels. The problem is that soot can cause atmospheric warming that's 100 to 2,000 times stronger than CO2. And while it doesn't linger in the air for nearly as long, it lands on the snow and then just speeds up melting instead by reducing the albedo effect. Stanford atmospheric scientist Mark Jacobson says this will create a positive feedback loop, worse than CO2 in a climate already warming more than three times as fast as the global average. Like, we're not trying to defrost Yvonne of the Yukon here. Please, the last thing Inuit need are more colonizers. Yvonne. Yvonne. 
But dust isn't the only concern about the current operation and proposed railway. Years of Inuit conservation work of caribou is being put at risk, and prime breeding grounds for narwhal are already being affected by shipping routes. NTI biologist David Lee determined that caribou do cross the proposed railway path, as well as the path of a proposed expansion line running south to Steensby Inlet. Any railway this far north in Canada would be a first, let alone one crossing caribou habitat. QIA senior ecology researcher Susan Leach called it an experimental situation, going on to say that moving ahead while relying on so many assumptions was a weakness. At community hearings, Inuit hunters expressed their lack of confidence that caribou would cross a trucking road or railroad, noting that they're sensitive enough to their surroundings to stop at a snowmobile track. A former Pond Inlet mayor added that female caribou are particularly sensitive to the scent of colonial capitalist exploitation human activity. Baffinland, on the other hand, were confident caribou would cross the tracks, despite having no data from North Baffin to base that on, only tangential data from diamond mines in the northern mainland. Oh no! Not to mention no impacts of the interim period of scaled up trucking were assessed at all, leaving David Lee to question the validity of their study. And when a member of the Minimatalik Hunters and Trappers Organization, or HTO, pressed on whether Inuit hunters thought the railroad embankments would be a barrier to caribou, Baffinland said the hunters agreed caribou are physically able to cross, but couldn't say whether they would. Narwhal are already being put at risk by current shipping levels. A study last year found that levels of the stress hormone cortisol have increased 200% compared to the years before the 583% increase in shipping traffic straight through the breeding waters of 10% of the world's narwhal to the port in Milne Inlet. It's an early warning indicator that needs further study in order to better understand how this will affect reproductive health of the narwhal long term. Another study by Scripps Institution of Oceanography found that sound pollution by ships overlap and interfere with sounds that narwhal and ringed seals use to communicate and navigate, whether a ship was within a few kilometers or more than 30 clicks away. So it's safe to assume that stress levels and health risks will only increase as Baffinland's Phase 2 expansion more than doubles output from 81 to 176 two-way shipments. And then, because these trips cross Greenland's ocean jurisdiction, the Canadian government affirmed the Kingdom of Denmark's right to weigh in, which I'm pretty sure is colonial bingo. Anyway, Greenland sent a memo to Ottawa stating, quote, the Mary River project must be considered one of the greatest threats to marine mammals in the Arctic. Possible oil spills, whale collisions, and ice-breaking ships disrupting the habitat of seals, walruses, and whales, including the bowhead, which are just starting to return after a century. A similar exile might be seen among the narwhal that live in Eclipse Sound. Such a loss of biodiversity would further destabilize the region. But okay, I know what you're thinking. Stop denying Inuit the right to cash in on the ecosystems they've inherited from generations of living in balance with nature and held onto through decades of land claim negotiations with the Canadian state who have taken 80% of Nunavut. This isn't just going to benefit a multinational corporation owned by Luxembourg-based steel giant ArcelorMittal and a US-based private equity firm, you say? After all, there's an agreement on the table worth over a billion dollars in potential income for Inuit communities. And let's not forget... Inuit do want jobs and development. Well, a report by John Loxley, professor of economics at University of Manitoba, gives a sneak peek at just who exactly will be benefiting from the expansion project. First, it's worth highlighting that Baffinland actually plans to expand Mary River not to 12 megatons, but actually to 30 megatons, or five times its current output by 2035. Oh, no. They already have approval to ship the extra 18 megatons out of a port in Steensby to the south. So after noting the high levels of scientific uncertainty about the impact on the ecosystem, Loxley moves on to examine how this rapid expansion will be a barrier to meaningful employment for Inuit in local communities. Few will qualify for the 46% of the jobs that require apprenticeship or post-secondary training. Another 43% of jobs require occupation-specific training and will also be difficult to qualify for, leaving only 11% of presumably lower-paid jobs with on-site training options available to locals. Only 2,200 Inuit were expected to be among the available labor force to begin with, so between these qualifications barriers, family dependencies, and other socioeconomic factors, the labor force is likely to dip below 
a thousand. Inuit share of revenue already got cut in half from 2016 to 2017, and with Baffinland's plans to balloon as quickly as possible, Loxley calculates that while the sum of Inuit wages will double, those wages per ton of ore will drop from $2.60 in 2016 to $1.37 by 2022, and their share of revenue will buckle from 4% to just 1.7%, bringing us back to the concern about employment rates. If the number of Inuit who can be appropriately educated and then employed can't be doubled over that period, the gap only widens. The company claims their $3.5 billion investment has been a boon to the Nunavut economy, but despite the project representing 24% of the territory's GDP, it employs only 288 Inuit. And they say that unless the railroad is approved, the mine will no longer be financially viable. This was published in response to an independent report by natural resource analysts Open Oil, which claimed that while the train would surely increase profits, the current profit and loss level is still considered normal for many mining businesses. Baffinland scoffed at the report. The drama. This caused their mask to slip a little bit when they said that the issue is that they haven't been able to provide investors with a return on their investment. And there it is, folks. Maximizing shareholder profits become the primary concern over delivering equity for Inuit communities, driving an ASAP approach to exploiting their lands, throwing the ecosystem off balance, and possibly jeopardizing their cultural way of life forever all in exchange for a paltry share of the wages. Which brings us right back around to the Phase 2 community hearings and protests. Back in Pond Inlet, Saturday was the one day of the two-week-long hearing where regular community members and the general public could give statements. Um, so I'm asking you, can you slow down? We're not trying to close down um, Mary River, but can you slow down your proposal? Early on in the hearings, communities expressed a distrust for how Baffinland was using their traditional knowledge. The Inuit Kao Yimaya Tukangit, or IQ, is a set of principles that includes respecting and caring for all living things, decision making through discussion and consensus, and working for the common good. Pond Inlet and Igloo League raised concerns with the Nunavut Impact Review Board, or NIRB, that company reports show they had reduced the IQ to simple data points, erasing the cultural importance of the knowledge. Baffinland was engaging Inuit to acquire the info, but excluding them from its interpretation. The Kikitani Inuit Association, or QIA, highlighted crucial IQ findings in their 2019 final report. There were three areas of major concern with the project expansion where uncertainty persists. How will the railway and shipping traffic increase impact caribou, narwhal, and local ecosystems? How will increased economic benefits to Inuit communities be realized when phase one benefits weren't realized to begin with? And how will this expansion compound the already noticeable impacts to Inuit culture and their traditional use of the land? As community meetings continued, tensions grew. Clyde Rivers Mayor Natanin said that metaphorically, this means war. And when the Mitamatalik HTO chair was asked how satisfied he was, he said he was the least satisfied. Of the five affected communities, only Pond Inlet got a teleconference hub to participate, even as North Baffin leaders were requesting the hearings be postponed until they could be safely held face to face so that all perspectives could be heard and considered as one. Mayor Natanin commented that going against the wishes of the community in this way is the sort of thing that's been happening since colonization started. Oh, no. And then it was revealed that Baffinland and the QIA had signed an Inuit Certainty Agreement, or ICA, which would allow the project to move ahead. The mayors and HDO chairs of Mitamatalik, Igloolik, Sanarayak, Arctic Bay, and Clyde River sent a letter to the QIA and several government and Baffinland stakeholders, noting that they believed there wasn't adequate consensus in the community for the agreement. They hadn't had meaningful discussions about the content of the ICA and whether the QIA's technical concerns had actually been addressed. There wasn't even a summary of the agreement made available in Anuktitut, which they felt unfairly limited their ability to understand and discuss the contents as a community. The mayors and HGO chairs say they are responsible for developing consensus among their communities based on a balanced and fair consideration of all issues involved in the proposal. Ultimately, they felt there was not adequate consensus for the agreement to be made. And don't you think it's weird that that didn't stop Dan Vandal, Liberal Minister of Northern Affairs, from using the ICA to urge that the project move ahead into the next phase of review? Let's see if they've changed their tune in response to MP Kuk Kuk's earlier question. 
Everything that we do across the North, we do in conjunction with Indigenous people. We do with consultation and from listening to Northerners. I don't know, is it just me that wonders if maybe Inuit don't feel listened to? It's unfortunate that it, that they felt they had to, to go to those extremes uh, to be heard. Yeah, see what I mean? It is unfortunate that Inuit don't feel they're being heard, and that Baffinland is still pushing against the NIRB extensions, asking for the hearings to be completed on schedule, ASAP. It's in direct opposition to the community and NIRB desire to allow everyone the ability to voice and hear all the relevant information, experience, and knowledge as one to achieve consensus. And the thing is, Part of the conflict stems from the OG Nunavut Agreement. That agreement made the QIA the sole manager of Inuit-owned lands, making them Baffinland's only Inuit landlord, and a powerful one at that. Tens of millions of dollars have been poured into the QIA's coffers in the last few years, and they get the final say on what piece of that pie, or the Inuit Certainty Agreement benefits that they negotiated, gets redistributed to hamlets like Pond Inlet. These communities hold almost no land by comparison, and by extension little bargaining power, so it's not surprising to see the Guardians defend the Nulujat lands they feel are theirs. In the end, they made an agreement with the mayor of Pond Inlet to end the blockade in exchange for a meeting to negotiate with the QIA and NTI. But Baffinland still went the extra mile and got a court injunction to prevent the Guardians from blockading again under threat of arrest. And while the Guardians waited for their meeting, news broke that the QIA voted to no longer support the Phase 2 expansion, citing the impacts on their ecosystem, the limited use of IQ, and the lack of a jointly developed adaptive management plan. They noted that they're open to new proposals that prioritize Inuit involvement from the jump and their vision of the future. And then a few weeks later, they strengthened their position. Through formal resolution, the QIA board uh, is opposing phase two and the vote was unanimous, but it wasn't just a QIA uh, push in terms of the support. So the, the important piece there is that it was a uh, collective in terms of uh, different members, especially from folks from Pond Inlet who are the most impacted. The QIA now outright opposes the Phase 2 expansion following preliminary talks with protesters. President PJ Echeagok said that with nearly a decade of experience in the role, one lesson for everyone is the need for deep involvement of Inuit from the design stage forward, particularly for the most impacted communities. But the final say on the project doesn't land with the communities, the QIA, or even even the NIRB. The eventual decision on whether the mine will expand will not be made by Inuit or Nunavumiut. It will be made by Ottawa. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, cool, cool. How could that go wrong? And while it might be over for now, the Nuladjuk land defenders have proven that just seven determined Inuit can bring a multi-million dollar mine with 700 employees to a standstill. And how Inuit apply that knowledge going forward may be the most interesting part of the story of all. So there you go, that's another video on ice. I hope you enjoyed this first in the Northern series. Make sure to subscribe for more. Leave a like if you think the community should have final say over the mine and its expansion. And leave a comment about what other Northern issues you want me to cover in a future Frozen Waffles. Thanks as always to my patrons who support this channel. If you think what I do is valuable, you can join them with just an hour's wage per month at the link below. I'll see you all next time, and until then, always waffle to the left.